What is going on, all my crypto friends out there? Thank you guys again for joining me here. Today we have a special guest, and if you came for that alpha, then you are here on the right day. Please, everyone, help me welcome to the channel, Mr. Herman, Herman, <laughs> Mr. Herman Narula. What is going on, Herman? Great to meet you. I'm glad to be in a position to outbeard and out mustache you on this channel. <laughs> outbeard for <laughs> sure. I don't know about the mustache, though. We'll, we'll, we'll have to decide that as we go. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me here today to talk a little bit about your journey in, you know, not just crypto, not just you know, the metaverse, but everything beyond, uh, because there are, you have a lot of great things going on right now, and we're going to talk about all of them, and we're going to dive into, you know, things that you're doing in the industry, right, things you've done out of the industry, and what you have coming up next and dropping some alpha. So if you guys are ready for that, this is definitely something you want to stick around for and watch the all the way through. But before we get into the nitty gritty, before we get into the, all the good stuff, the hotness, I want to hear just a little bit from you about, you know, yourself. Tell us, you know, just introduce yourself for the people who don't know who you are. And, uh, you know, give us a little bit of a background on how you got to where you are right now. Sure. I mean, look, I, from my earliest memory to now, I've been obsessed with one thing, which is going to go live in other realities and other worlds. Um, maybe that made me kind of a messed up kid, but I convinced, you know, <laughs> right all, the, all the kids um, in my first school, um, if any of you are, are watching, I'm really sorry about this, but I, I convinced them all to spend their entire recess period looking for stones to open magic portals to other worlds. And, you know, this went on for some time until the teachers put a stop to what was essentially a labor camp, uh, you know, within within the school at that, at that stage. So, you know, I, I guess my point is more, I mean, I'm a computer scientist, I'm a gamer, like many of the founders of Improbable, but we've been on like a lifelong journey, you know, Rob paid his way through college in Second Life. I spent more hours than I'd like to count in role-playing games and other things to, to sort of yeah. make these other worlds a reality. And and the met, we're calling it the metaverse now, but really to us as kids, it was, it was, it, we didn't have a word for it, but it was this other realm, this other world where we needed to, yeah. needed to do that. That's what, that's what my journey has been about. Yeah. I mean, I'm right there with you, man. I, you know, same thing at growing up, you know, very big into sci-fi and fantasy and RPGs, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons and moving on into computer games, you know, playing early games like Doom. And then the first online games, which is like what you're talking about is like, you know, the, the start of what we would call a metaverse now. Uh, which is which is interesting, and, and so you know, very similar journey uh, in in that kind of respect. And so you know, now we've gone to the point where you you've been doing this for a long time, and you've created your own company, and you guys are pushing the boundaries of what is actually possible here in what we call the metaverse, right? What what, what we see in technology and in computing and in gaming, you know, addressing some of the large problems. In particular, you know, the fact that hey, you know, when I want to go play online. I want to play with everybody. I want to, I want to, I want all the homies there. I want everybody who's on the server playing in one big massive world. I don't want to have to be relegated to this server and that server and you, my friends over here but he can't transfer his character and you got to shard all the things otherwise you can only have x amount of people on a server. And and we 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 run into that and and it's it's one of those things that breaks immersion, right? You think, oh, "Okay, I got to do this." And it's like it, it's it's not it's not the most pleasant experience and I think it's a challenge that, you know, a lot of us you know, face as gamers looking for that truly immersive, you know, metaverse as it were to really just get lost in, you know, go find that magic portal and be gone for days. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about uh, Improbable as a company and the technology into that you guys are working on and, and how this kind of came about, how you got to the point where like, this is what I want to be doing. And, and this is what, you know, my company wants to focus on amongst other things, obviously, but this kind of being uh, so, some of the main focus, right? So we've had a long challenging uh, road. Um involving a lot of development, writing and rewriting, building, launching games, them not doing so well, launching other games, getting building our reputation and getting to a place where we've been able to solve these problems. Um, but in essence, the hard problem that my company is about, that I'm about, is how do we create new experiences that are worth the time and energy people put into them and are differentiated from what they can have in the real world or what they can already have in video games? And at the core of that problem, especially in multiplayer, is one number and that is operations per second so this is a metric that you know if you if you don't know anything else about technology and virtual worlds you should think about this one metric it's the amount of useful stuff that can simultaneously happen inside a world so how many interactions can happen how much communication can occur and if you want to have 
as you put it, all the homies and thousands of people, millions of people in a world, uh, you know, you, you need you need not thousands of messages a second, which is where Fortnite is at, uh, or millions, which is where WhatsApp is at globally. You need billions of operations right. a second. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and to get to the scale of billions, every single thing needs to be rewritten. Rendering, voice communication, network protocols, mm -hmm. distribution approaches. It's just an unending nightmare of different technical challenges. And you know, we, we, we've rewritten um, our core technology probably four times. We even had an older version called Spatial OS, which had a lot of challenges in um, how you would adopt it, difficulty of use, cost. And with our latest M2 technology, you know, we now feel like we're head and shoulders above anybody else who's ever put anything publicly out there. Um, and that's very exciting, but that's only one problem. The other really big problem is, well, how do you make these worlds valuable? And I would argue that the business model to do that is very different from video games. And it's entirely rooted in digital assets and it's rooted in ownership and it's rooted in, in Web3 principles. And so that's what M Squared is about. It's taking the technology to build cool worlds and creating an economic system where many platforms and worlds can cooperate and coexist, which is so vital to unlocking the real potential of, of the kind of Web3 digital asset revolution. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, when you look at, like I said, you're solving these types of problems, you know, building it from the ground up like that and saying, hey, you know what, instead of using all the, the same old tricks that we've been using, using the same old technology everyone's been using, we need to think about this from the ground level and really literally just start from scratch. That's a hard thing to do and to, to swallow it as a company because, you know, these days it, it's a lot easier to make a game than it was 10, 15 years ago before we had, you know, game development SDKs like, like Unity or like Unreal Engine where people can just jump in and boom, boom, boom. You know the program, you can do it. Uh, before it was, it was a lot more difficult. And I think that, that you know, that actually speaks to, to kind of what you guys are doing and, and shows how much dedication you have to that goal because like i said that's something that the challenge that almost nobody is willing to take on these days right it's it's also one of those like massive but invisible technical problems which consumers mm. um are going to benefit from the solution of but are it's almost going to feel like oh wasn't that always possible like the example i use is like the early internet you know we take for granted now that you can scale a website to like 100 million people you know interacting right. with it like oh google search just works or you know amazon just lets you buy stuff you know but the behind the scenes, the logistical and engineering marvels of things like Google. I mean, Google search is one of the few things on earth that handles trillions and trillions of, mm. of you know, massive operations requests. And, you know, to, to actually architect that as a resilient non mainframe backend built out of commodity hardware um, was an invention that we don't think of Google as having invented. We think of them as having solved search, but they had to invent that problem. They had to invent that solution just to make this possible. You know, Amazon, we think of as being about buying awesome stuff. But, you know, for many years, everyone thought logistics would make it an unviable business. We forget this now, but like, you know, there was year after year, kind of like we see now with crypto, where people are like, oh, transactions are never going to be efficient enough. The system will never work. No, nobody thought online delivery for a while was, you know, was, 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 was going to be financially viable. So, you know, building more operations per second, doing this back end stuff, like we're not necessarily doing the flashy front end stuff that awesome brands are going to do with, and are doing with our with our platform and with our help. But, you know, this is this sort of the kind of underlying engineering is, is what we want to solve. You know, we want we want to be a bit like um, aspirationally, a bit like TSMC, if, if you know them, mm. they, they make um, one of the most valuable companies in the world. They make um, they fabricate microchips for everyone, but most consumers have never heard of them. Right. They're they're supporting everyone else's success. That's what sure. we want to be. Yeah, I mean that's that's work that is not sexy, but damn it, if we don't need to have that working, you know, th those base layers, right? Uh, you know, and those base protocols and base technology that people are going to build everything off of, uh, it, it's it's vital, right? Like I said, it's it maybe doesn't have that end, you know, consumer focused sexiness, but without that, without someone willing to go that route, uh, you know, we don't end up getting a really cool product in the end. No, totally. And we do a lot of consumer development of metaverses. So the other thing we do is we build worlds, like we're building other side. And we have loads of game developers that support and do that. But we really see that as being about supporting incredible communities and ecosystems like Yugo and like other partners right. that were, 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 which I can't accidentally announce now because that would be really, really bad. Um, that were, that were, that were, that we'll be announcing. <laughs> I mean, no one watches the show, anyways. You could totally just maybe <laughs> leak a partner that no one would know. But we're also we're also like focused on, okay, if we're going to be neutral and we're going to be an enabling company, we can actually play another really important role, which is we can help create interoperability standards mm -hmm. and cooperation because we're not competing with our customers. We don't have a horse in the race. So with the M squared network, you know, anyone uh, will be able to build a metaverse uh, on top, which 
has to have interoperable avatars and, and certain other things that we'll reveal later in the year. But that ecosystem isn't like controlled by Improbable. It's initially operated by Improbable, but it's going to be controlled by all of the companies and, and teams and communities that are creating value on top of it. You know, that's really important. Otherwise, why should I build a business on, on what ultimately is somebody else's platform? Yeah, and that's a that's you know that speaks to a lot of things here that we talk about on the channel. A standards, something I talk about all the time, and these are things that that vault a tech industry forward. Every time we've been able to establish a tech standard, it has been a boon for the industry and and has pushed everything forward. And then also, you know, being able to to look at you know like okay, well, uh, you know, centralized entities where we're, we we don't have to be reliant on them, right? Where you say okay, well, hey, if you're using this thing, then you're relying on these guys, and if they change something. Well, then you're screwed because you've built everything on this third-party platform, similar to like what we see right now with YouTube and we're streaming on Twitch and, you know. And, and maybe this is something that some of your viewers may not, may not know, but it isn't only a moral or ethical challenge, right? Like it's a very simple economic challenge. Like if you build a business mm -hmm. on a platform like Horizon Worlds and you make $10 of revenue, how do I as an investor value that $10? Well, right. I'm not going to give you 20x uh, credit on revenue. Well, why? Because that revenue could change tomorrow, right? If I, Why should I give you 10 years or 20 years worth of credit or even respect your growth rate? Because at any point, Facebook could could steal your feature or yoink. up your prices or, or yoink your access to data. So it means yeah. that as a growth investor or a VC, I'm not going to invest in a company building content on Horizon Worlds, which means Facebook has to pay all the money to incentivize people to go and do that and right. incentivizing people just to just to kind of be part of the epic game store you know epic has done an incredible job i think in giving away free giveaways things like that i think somebody once estimated it was like in the tens of billions the free games that they've wow. given out to, to great yeah. users it also doesn't cost them that but it's more like you know the different deals that they've struck you know i just don't see it being possible to bribe the entirety of real world culture like every sports league every celebrity like everyone you're just gonna like pay them all to join your world garden. You know, there isn't enough money in the world, uh, you know, to, to, to know, kind of man. go <laughs> they, You know, I think it's one of those things where they, they want to get an avalanche. They they figure like, if we pay enough people, then then that'll yeah. be, and, they'll give them, and then it'll just it's be a snowball there. effect, right? It's tough because a lot of people have gotten wise. Like what's funny for me is yeah. all of the partners wanting to build worlds on M squared right now. And um, the ones that we're dealing with and, you know, in a pre-launch state, these are like big public brands. And, and what partners are those? Partners um, you know, I, I, sorry, my English is not so good. I, I don't, I, I can't <laughs> understand what you're saying. I completely lost the ability to, to I can only say this sentence and, and the one explaining it. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> but the, point, the, the, the point I'm making here is they're not in gaming. Um, so generally the partners that we are, we're excited by are in, you know, fashion, sport, music, they, they're mm -hmm. in, they're outside of gaming. There, there are no, I mean, I have a completely stuffed pipeline of, of partnerships and not one of them is a traditional video games company, which is really yeah. strange. You know, mm -hmm. it's because traditional video games companies have no interest in interoperability. Why would they? You know, they spent billions of dollars acquiring users. They want to give those users away, right? That's not going to happen. They will. You know, like, yeah. They will. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. You're right. Not yet because we haven't had, we haven't seen that paradigm shift yet. But they will. Yeah, we, we also forget. We, we also forget that like we keep talking about this metaverse market, like it's a, like it's a multi trillion dollar space. I think that's true. <laughs> you know, so I believe that. But, no, but 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 it, there's like but like you know if you're a gaming company and you're making a video game, and the video game is sold on a store, and you're monetizing that through in-app purchases on iOS or on PC or whatever, mm -hmm. you're part of a very large industry, but an industry that's grown at seven to eight percent a year every year. You could set your watch to it for like thirty years. This year it's sure. contracting because I think it had a Corona boom and then a, then a con contrast. But you, you're not going to get to trillions by compounding that you know within the five year six year time scale that people believe. So. There's got to be a new market, new experiences, new audiences, new business models. Otherwise, it's, it's not the metaverse. I mean, it's, it's just a rebranded yeah. video games. Now, kind of switching a little bit of mode here, you know, kind of talking about the video game focus and what you guys have done so far sure. with, uh, you know, Improbable. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the, the big achievement that we've seen here recently is, you know, this first trip with the other side metaverse, being able to get 4,600 plus or minus, you know, kind of concurrent players all in as the same map all at once and running, you know, about what 30 frames FP, you know, of frames per second, just right. smooth, just, you know, butter, <laughs> right? So yeah, tell us a little bit about was, that and, and kind of like what, what, how that feels sure. as an achievement and, and how you go and people, like, how do they think about it? Like, like, are they excited about so, that? I mean, so on the interesting thing is we're very, we're also a, um, we think, we hope, a pretty important part now of the uh, Western high-end games industry. So we support about 60 different publishers. 
Um, this is not with our metaverse technology, with M squared or with all the cool stuff that we're doing this year. This is mm -hmm. just providing high end expertise in helping them build game engines, work on key titles, build key network infrastructure. So we're in a really unusual place where, you know, we built the multiplayer mode of all guys. You know, if you've played a major shooter, we've probably, we've, we've probably got someone who's worked or actively worked as part of improbable on supporting that shooter. Maybe it's store, maybe it's online services, maybe it's engine, you know, like we've, we, you know, we've worked with companies like Epic. So. All of that learning has kind of led us to a somewhat cynical and pragmatic attitude towards how to ship experiences for partners. Because you just see, you see how different kind of, you know, video games and, and things are and, and those experiences are. Um, you know, yeah. when, you, when you talk about um, how, how did we feel about being able to do something like Other Side at that scale, really excited, but very excited about the non-gaming. I mean, like, was, was First Trip a game? Like, in a way it was. You, you had things you had to do, but there was like a live actor there. Like, it, it's really, it's like, is, is film television? I, you know, kind of, is it theater? I mean, I guess they all have scripts. So we're right, really right. starting to see this like emergent new medium in, in what we do and in what we're enabling. Um, also in terms of numbers, um, if you want a little bit of alpha, I will say, um, you know, we did, we've done 4,600 then. We, I gave a very heavily, um, uh, like a little leak of about 20,000 CCU in a little demo uh, a few weeks ago. I will say that that uh, we we actually, we actually deliberately showed a demo with a smaller number than the number we can actually do. Um, partly because Ooh. we felt it would be nice to kind of stage things a little bit, but so the actual capabilities, and I think if you eagle eyed on the maths and you look at the fact that we said 2 billion operations a second, you can start to calculate how much CCU we could probably support and also where we might be in terms of ops per second. So we can do a lot more than, um, than we've said. And, most video games don't want that. You know, Call of Duty wouldn't necessarily be more fun if you had 50,000 people shooting each other. Um, and, right, you know, it, right. it, it might be a, a, a different game that could be really fun if you had 50,000 people shooting each other, but it probably wouldn't be caught. Whereas football matches are absolutely more fun when you've got 50,000 people in them, like watching them and interacting with them. Yeah, or, or I mean, really, the, the, my use case for this is, is like an MMO, right? Where you have you know, a million people playing like a, a World, of War class, uh, World of Warcraft classic and there's that many people playing. They're all on different servers, but they could potentially play all in sure. one massive map, right? They I could, mean, they, they could, but if we think about the economics of this, you start to see why that probably wouldn't be the first couple of use cases. Because an MMO, we know this painfully, the hard way. Um, you know, we, as anyone who's followed the company knows, uh, you know, we're 10 years in, we've, we've made a bunch of different, uh, you know, games, uh, good and mm -hmm. bad, that, we, that we've launched and part of. An MMO takes like three, four, five years of work. Oh, yeah. You have to yeah, balance awesome. it. You've got to get everything right. You know, the, the, the progression has to work. The combat has to be fun. The, the whole thing has to work. And it'll probably cost you a few hundred million dollars. And that's before you make any revenue. If you're making like a top end AAA, uh, you know, MMO yeah. or, uh, inside a blizzard or somewhere like that, you know, consider, considering where game budgets are reaching right now, um, you don't have to do any of that to create value in the metaverse. I mean, just this show, like you, me, a few thousand fun people hanging out, you know, we could create an hour of fun that might be worth, you know, say a dollar of someone's energy or time way cheaper and way quicker than we could launch an MMO. And then we could add more activities to that and we could open up the SDKs and we could let people grow it. So if you get away from this mindset of, of trying to build a finished giant game and instead incrementally create experiences and monetize those experiences with digital assets, because guess what? If, I, if we sell people a t-shirt, they can wear it somewhere else you create a much more efficient way of converting money into game content than currently right, right. exists in the games industry. And I think the MMOs and Battle Royale games that emerge uh, on M Squared and on in, in metaverses like Other Side, if, if such things emerge, they're going to be quite different to the experiences that people are used to because they're going to be able to draw upon the entire network of avatars and content that exist within the network as a whole. So imagine mm -hmm. if you, know, you, you had people taking their football jerseys you know, into a combat game of some kind, right? Like that would be technically possible with the rules of the M squared network. And the, nobody would have to have agreed to that, you know, because you, you can take your avatar out of your world and the new world right. could accept your avatar and choose to create a fun game on top of it. So it's, it's going to be, it, just to really summarize, and I think I've ranted a bit on this, but like, it's exactly like the jump from theater to TV and film. They're similar, right. like video games are similar to the metaverse. They involve scripts and actors and similar things, but they're totally different business. And, and, you know, kind of then, then kind of going on the other side, there's a contrast of like, okay, wow, you could do a, a massive amount of players or what you could possibly do with something like this as well as, as deliver an incredibly high end realistic looking experience that you typically don't get because of the limitations of hardware and the limitations of calculations per second that you get in a regular game. Yeah. So we're talking about movie quality type of like uh, of, of CGI 
and and that's playable CGI. Like it, like is, so is that could, also possible? You could, what you guys are doing? You could you could still you could actually do thousands and thousands of people. Probably not the same as the absolute maximum we can hit, but thousands of people with battles. Like and you don't have to take my word for this. There's video online of. Uh, the Battle of Scotty Lake. So we did a little demo. Uh, this was not using pixel streaming. This was with a downloaded client um, mm -hmm. where people interacted. A couple thousand people battled 10,000 AI with melee weapons in an FPS experience. And it was really fun and really cool. And actually, I'm really surprised that the majority of the demand for metaverse experiences looks more like hanging out with celebrities or communities. But you can absolutely do that type of... We designed the system to support sniper rifles and you know low latency shooting and those kinds of things. We've just, you know, we just don't need to do that for a lot of the projects that are currently um, are working together. In fact, that was a, a complete surprise. I had no idea that it was fun to just hang out and talk with a crowd online. I would have, I would have canceled that game if it was one we were making. You know, I would have been like, that's going to be boring. But you know, I'm, I'm just shocked at how how responsive people are to it. Well, I mean, and that's what we see with some of the major titles anyways. You know, when you talk about Fortnite and what people are doing there most of the time, I mean, it, it's gotten to the point where it's not that everyone is playing, you know, the, the Battle Royale matches. They're hanging out, man. They're, they're, you know, they're watching concerts in there. They're socializing with friends. And so, you know, that, that doesn't surprise me at all because I, I feel like that's where we're kind of, you know, that, that's one of those, those stepping stones to getting to what we consider like a true metaverse, right? Understanding that you have these connected experiences that people are doing in real time and they, they provide value beyond what you can get in you know this in this real world right here and so that kind of brings me to to i think my next question is i want to hear you define the metaverse here because your definition of that in particular what, what we're going to talk about here next is is your upcoming book but your definition of what a metaverse truly is i think was actually a really great one and and, and not an angle that we see very often so i'd love for you guys i'd love for you to like really just relay that to everyone out here who's, who's watching there's a whole chapter in the book about this. I'm going to explain this a bit differently to how I normally do. I'm going to state the definition, and then I'm going to derive it. So I'm going to help you see why I think that's the right definition. So mm -hmm. first of all, why do we care about this topic? Like, why does it matter? Well, it matters. And, you know, I'm sure you, I know we've talked about this before. And, you, you know, we, you, I, I think you've tweeted a little bit about this. So we have similar views. But if you define what this thing is wrong, if you define the industry that you're in wrong, you define your market size wrong, you mm -hmm. define your investment thesis wrong. Are smart TVs the metaverse market? And you're then you're a metaverse investor. So do you invest in smart TVs now? Is is VR the metaverse? Is it the main infrastructure? Like, you know, we have to remember all of this in the end is an effort and capital allocation problem, right? We're all dreamers dreaming about what we should invest in, what we should work on. And if we think the metaverse is about bicycles, then we're all going to be wasting our time on the wrong thing. And it's happened before. You know, during the the dot-com boom, you know, there were an amazing number of successful companies that came out of the internet. There were also a pile of crap companies in 1995, six, seven, eight, you know, those years. We don't talk about them anymore, but companies that had like insane business models or tried to do stuff on the internet that made no sense. So the definition is very, very important because it defines how we create value. So that's the first thing. So how do we define the metaverse? Well, I would say the metaverse is a, a network of meaning that connects together different socially constructed realities. So sport and the real world, our society, they form a metaverse. Um, people can become famous in sport and then that fame can transfer into the real world. You could um, imbue the events that happen in a sporting field with meaning. When you see all those like Brazilians crying at you know the World Cup because their team loses, um, you know, which which famously was pretty bad one of the previous World Cups, you know, that's real emotion. They're imbuing meaning and value into this other world. So the metaverse is about commerce between socially constructed realities, the exchange of value between worlds. And why this is a really important notion is because it shows you that it doesn't have to involve technology. The metaverse is actually, or metaverses have existed as long as we've had uh, culture, sport, fashion is a great example as well. And the key component of value here is it's got to involve meaningful exchange of value between these worlds. So now when you think about why video games aren't a good starting point for the metaverse, it starts to make sense because you can't take value from World of Warcraft into Call of Duty. I don't mean you technically can't. I mean, it doesn't make sense to. Like, you know, the example I love to use is, is Harry Potter and Call of Duty because it's so absurd. But, you know, imagine taking a machine gun in and murdering Professor Snape, you know, from, from like with your sniper rifle. It's, it's cool that sounding. That sounds fun. I'm down yeah, for that, for man. <laughs> it really ruins my Hogwarts experience, right? Like it's, or imagine yeah. a better example would be imagine in the middle of the World Cup final in football, suddenly someone just runs on with a baseball bat and just starts playing baseball in the middle of the game, right? You know, it, it would be, it breaks apart um, the, the tapestry of meaning. And that helps us understand that a metaverse is, and being creative in the metaverse is not like just creating imaginary fun. 
it's more like playing a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. You've got to add to the tapestry of things that are already there. That's how our culture works. Things have to interoperate in and, and, and therefore be restricted in what they can be to create this wider meaning and wider value. The metaverse isn't the next step in the internet because the internet and the metaverse are fundamentally different things. And the example I use is like, you know, nobody else sees you when you're on a website, you're just there by yourself. Um, but the number of people that are in the environment with you with the metaverse completely changes the experience, right? It, it, it wholly alters what you're doing. So it's this socially constructed set of worlds connected by a network of meaning. And the value of a metaverse is about the experiences it can facilitate and then the transfer of value between worlds and from those worlds into the real world. That's, that's the, the heart of my definition. Yeah, and I think you really hit the nail on the head there. You know, when you talk about, you know, oh, people saying, "Oh, the the you know the the metaverse will be the next internet," and really, what we what what we really mean here is that, you know, the internet is a way for us to connect, uh, you know, globally and connect with each other. And when we talk about well, well, what is actually the the next evolution of something like that, it, it may be a socially constructed thing. Maybe it is VR, but these are all these are all modes to get to exactly. what essentially exactly. the metaverse is, is going to give us. Right, is these connected experiences that are beyond what we are experiencing here in in what we consider real life. Right. Uh, and, and so I think exactly. that, that that's where I think a lot of people kind of get confused in that respect. You know, the internet is, is the is like the early iteration of being able to do that, right? Before we had the internet, we 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 weren't connecting like that. We were connecting in other in other ways, right? Through through stories, through song, through myths, through traditions, and you know, through you know, a, 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 like a fanatics, you know, people who, who are just crazy about some certain thing. And so we, we we keep evolving that as it goes, and technology helps us to do that. But I think the metaverse becomes more of an umbrella type of term versus it being like this is the next evolution of it because we're, we're always trying to connect to the metaverse in, in any way it is using whatever technology it is that's the latest technology. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really well said. It's also important to highlight how essential it is. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I talk about this in my book, but the ability to have another world that we all agree upon where we can change things and play by the same set of rules, even when we're enemies, is incredibly helpful to human beings. So like yes. I talk about this a little bit, but there's a famous battle called the Battle of the Eclipse where the Medes and the Lydians, uh, this is sort of like an ancient, uh, Gre I believe ancient Greece, yeah. Um, they basically were in the middle of a battle an eclipse happened and then they stopped and decided that the gods wanted them to make peace. And they wanted mm. to make peace anyway. They were they were sick of this war, but they all <laughs> yeah. had enough. It's they a all had enough. Oh, it's a sign. Yeah, totally. They all had enough of a common framework to be like, okay, there are gods. They get happy and unhappy about wars, eclipses, mm. that counts. You know, that's like transaction validated on the crypto blockchain of their metaverse, right? It's like, okay, <laughs> that's a big deal. We're allowed, we're allowed to agree that that meant something, right? And what's interesting is they're enemies, right? They're killing each other. They're trying to murder each other, but they both decide to agree that, you know, tangibly to this, to this other world. And I think part of what we have to realize is so much of our daily lives are like that. You know, what, why is an LVMH handbag valuable? Like, why is it valuable? Where does the yeah. value actually come from? I mean, it's certainly valuable. Why is a Patek Philippe valuable, you know, as a watch? Like, you know, they could make more of them. Patek Philippe could triple or quadruple their production. They don't. They, they only make 60,000 or whatever it is watches a year. And we as human beings, we're buying into the video game, the cultural game in which a Patek Philippe, because of its history, of its nature, is, is valuable. So it's a, the metaverse is a new way to understand our culture. It's nothing really to do with video games. Video games are just one thing you might do within a metaverse. Right. Right. And, and and like I said, when we made examples of, of what we're already seeing with that right now, with places like Fortnite, where you, you start to get this, this, you know, mass of people coming to one place and saying, hey, we want to be here. And then it starts to spawn additional experiences. And I think that we'll, we'll iterate over that over the next 10 years or so until we get to a point where, you know, we have something that that is, you know, interoperable and you know something that that people can agree on and can go in and experience these things and you know m maybe you do maybe you can take your gun from call of duty into harry potter but it becomes it becomes a want right you know and and, and we could do those types you know, of things uh, you could but the other important thing to bear in mind here and i think that's why fortnite is a good example is value has to come out for a metaverse to work you know it has to impact your real reality like what happens in World of Warcraft, you know, there's a famous South Park episode with World of Warcraft and they, they dramatize, they're constantly like, this could be the end of the world yeah. of Warcraft. You know, like it's, you know, <laughs> what, what happens in World of Warcraft is not going to be front page news in the Times. But what yeah. happens in the Football World Cup is going to be front page news in the Times. Like if, if, if the UK win the World Cup, that will be front page news. You know, right. and, and it's nothing to do with the fact that more people like football. It's to do with the fact that football is integrated with our real society in a very specific cultural way. 
we, you know, well, tacitly, politicians, academics, everybody considers sport to matter, even though it's completely absurd that it does. It's why does it matter more than Call of Duty? We, we just decided that it does. Well, you know, and I will say you're right there. And I, I would I disagree a little bit when it comes to games because I do feel like we are moving in that direction where games have be become more valid and they become more mainstream. I mean, 15 years ago when I was playing games, I'm, I was a nerd, man. You know what I'm saying? People are like, oh no, this guy's playing. Like it, 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 it was not cool to be a gamer, and now it is. And now you have you have esports tournaments that are, that are getting more people watching them than all football games combined. I mean, it is crazy getting to that point. So, so do, are we there where it's going to make front page? Not yet, but we're it's, definitely very close. We're very close. It's it's. I, I'd say that it's not to do with the popularity of the activity. Like the average age of a gamer is 34. There's 3.4 billion gamers roughly in the world, depending on how you count it, right? I mean, everybody games, right? The irony is the the very same people who would consider football I'm talking about soccer here, you know, it's a, a yes. worthy activity, but gaming not, probably game, right? You know, given, given, the, given the age group. So I think it's a little bit to do also with how value comes out of the system. Like, mm -hmm. you know, footballers earn like real crazy money when they play football and, you know, different people can own the value chain. Like no one owns, no one can take football away from you, right? Being good at soccer means being good at an eternal activity, right? God could change the rules tomorrow and suddenly you used to be the best God player in the world and now you're a bad God player, right? God could shut down, God could go away, um, you know? So mm -hmm. following the principles of community ownership and everyone being able to earn money and value being able to come out of a system is really important for society to actually connect with this other world in a useful way. So sure. if, you know, Fortnite were to have a cryptocurrency or, you know, and you could actually earn real money and that money could come out and you could have real ownership and confidence in things that you did in, in Epic, uh, in Epic's world and Epic gave up more power. Or if World of Warcraft began to integrate with the real world economy in a much more fundamental way, then we might actually operate quite differently. We might, we might, you know, it only takes a small minority, one or two or 3% of a population to completely transform how society sees something. I don't know, man. There's a lot of wow gold farmers out there. So I would argue that they, they might be already in the economy doing it. That's my, point. That's my point. It's not embraced, right? The power yes, of yes, crypto, true. the power of, 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 of Web3 as a subject for the metaverse is that that goes away from being a dirty activity to just being part of the experience of the world itself. These worlds become actual economies. And, and, you know, when we talk about, you know, value being, you know, coming out of these things, right, these these metaverses, whether it's sports, whether it's gaming, you know, I think one of the biggest values when we talk about this in particular is entertainment, right? So you can, you can, you can, it's hard to put a dollar number and say, well, how much value in entertainment wise did someone get out of something versus how much actual monetary value, right? Whether that's USD or crypto, whatever it may be, did they get out of this, right? And I think that's also a, a conversation to be had because yeah, but that's what most people are looking for here. They're looking for that that it's, that I experience mean, that they're they're gonna have with other people that is going to give them you know a, a great you know fun time. I, I think there's a cha I'll challenge you a little bit in that we've used the words entertainment and play quite a lot. One of the things that I found most most obstructive in trying to understand how to work on the metaverse is we think in terms of work and play, but psychology doesn't back that up. Like you know that isn't how our brains work or how fulfillment works. You know, there's a whole branch called self-determination theory, and it says every self-directed activity, you know, can provide you with fulfillment. And if you don't get enough fulfillment, which is, which doesn't mean fun, that means like meaningful experiences, mm -hmm. like having a meaningful relationship provides you with fulfillment, even if it's a sad relationship, right? At, at that moment in time, in fact, the sadness that can come from caring about someone is part of the, part of the cost of, of, of being fulfilled. Similarly, you know, when Roger Federer loses a game of tennis, you know, he's, He's very unhappy that he lost and it's a very miserable experience, but it's part of the activity. You know, you wouldn't sure. look at that and say he's being entertained. He's not being entertained, right? He doesn't look right. happy at all. He, he looks, you know, he looks like someone in anguish. So fulfillment is a better word well, because it better covers word. it. Yeah, but it covers a much broader sense of human experience. Yeah, no, no, you're right. And so, so I think that we definitely would want to replace that and saying ful getting fulfillment from things is, is an intangible that we, it's a little bit hard to measure and say, here's the dollar value that you can equate to fulfillment from whatever activity you're doing in whatever metaverse, whether it is digital or whether it's physical, right? So I think that's but an we, interesting point. We, we can, but we can actually put a dollar value to something, which is uh, how brutally under monetized so much real world culture is. I mean, a club, yeah. like FC Barcelona, you know, like a club like FC Barcelona has what, like half a billion fans, maybe, maybe more. Um, you know, how much money do they make per fan? Probably not very much, right? If you consider how few people can come to games. Imagine mm. Southeast Asian fans of Manchester United. They've never been to a game. They can't fly. They can't necessarily conveniently fly and do that. Imagine how many people have ever met Mick Jagger, right? Like actually met him, you know, like really hung out with him. 
how many more could if you could do so virtually, right? And he was really there. So right. there's a yeah, great yeah, deal yeah. Of, of value on the table for these communities that are big, but haven't monetized on a per user basis and don't necessarily have experiences that can be worth spending money on and bringing people together. If you're in the yeah. video games industry, you're already being margin squeezed. You're already paying billions to acquire customers that you're trying to shove like one more skin out of them on average mm. from their parents' credit card, you know, every, every six months. There's not a lot of greenfield value, you know, there, right? So I think we really have to turn to new areas uh, in order to understand where that spend will come from. And, and without consumer spending, the whole thing is pointless, right? You know, this is yeah. this is something we all have to bear in mind. Yeah, I mean, you, you're you're 100 right. You know, and I think the monetization aspects that we'll see here in the future are definitely going to shift as we, you know, kind of progress through what we're seeing here with these early metaverses and early VR worlds, and and you know, uh, you know, gamifying a lot of different industries. Understanding like, hey, well, here, you know, th this works actually really well in gaming. Can we apply it in other ways? Whereas these fans of 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 you know Barcelona, they're they're you know maybe, you're right. Maybe they can never go to a game, but they can play a uh, you know NFT card game manager that allows them to do that. And then you know what I'm saying. They're they're getting revenue and things like that. Like I said, so early steps of like what that looks like before they could be in an immersive experience in in a metaverse or VR or something that allows them to be there right in the in the stadium. It's also why we we work on the features we work on. I mean, look at our voice chat feature. It was such a pain to build a system that allows you know tens of thousands of people to simultaneously speak and all be heard at yeah. the same time. Now, is that useful Chaos. in a game of COD? Like, yeah, no, no, it's like, oh no. I mean, like in a game of COD, you'd be like, I don't know what the hell is going on or why this is good. Again, in a stadium, that's fundamental, right? The noise yeah. of the crowd, the, picking out that Huge. person with that rude chant, you know, it is the reason you're there, right? I'd go as far mm -hmm. as to say it's the reason you're there, right? You're there for that sense of community. So once again, you know, the features you'd build, if you believe the metaverse is about building a network of value, uh, would be completely different to if you believe it's just the next step in video games. This is probably mm -hmm. my main disagreement with some of the other commentators in the space and some of the other books that are out there. Yeah, very true. So let, let's uh, let's change you know uh, pace here and let's talk about your brand new book that is coming out here. It's coming out October 11th. It's called Virtual Society. I got a copy. This, I got an advanced oh, copy here that you sent. Um, you and, and, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so I, 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 I'm only on. I'm, I'm just. I just got past chapter one, but I, I'm liking it so far. And this is one of those books where I started reading. And I was like, I'm gonna have to take my time with this because it, it's, you know, it, it's that kind of book. You don't want to blow through it. You really want to understand the concept, concepts that, that you're laying down in this book because they're really good. I mean, even the intro itself does so much to really set you up for the rest of the book. And you know, before we jump into it and I let you talk to everybody about the book real quick, I have a question to ask you because after oh. reading the, the beginning of chapter one. And you talking about uh, Gobe uh, Gobekli Tepe? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I thought, is this guy, is this guy also a fan of Ancient Aliens? You watch that show? Oh Have my god, that show? that show is hilarious. That's hilarious. You've seen no, the no, show. No, I, I knew you had. I've only seen a, a YouTube video about the storyline of Ancient Aliens. Like it's like its own QAnon metaverse, like by itself. But no, no, I actually came across Gobekli Tepe uh, not not as a result of uh, a passion for late night History Channel, Born Stars, yeah. though great show, uh, you know, for, for, for the late nights uh, when you have nothing else to do. <laughs> but um, no, I actually came to it more because I wanted to answer the question, um, what what came first? Uh, you know, mm. do we build monuments when civilization is kind of going well and we have free time? Or do we build monuments for another reason? And Gobekli Tepe was shocking to me when I learned about it because it predates agriculture. Yes. So the people that built that thing, they didn't have farming. And yet they built these massive stone monuments in Turkey, you know, more than whatever it is, 10 to 14,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Th that must speak to some fundamental need for other worlds that is worth dying for, that is worth right. bleeding for. So I'm yeah. very, very intrigued by why, you know, and, you know, I think the argument of religion, like, it's a great argument, but it clearly meant more to people than just that, because everybody risked their lives, you know, like to make, to, yeah. to consume the resources to go and do that. You 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 should definitely watch some ancient aliens, man. I know it seems a little campy in a lot of things, but but a lot of the stuff that you were already talking about, in particular in that first chapter, they actually address in a in a kind of a weird, interesting way, and you know, put some things. Don't to, you don't you wrote, you wrote me in with ancient aliens? Don't you wrote you, me in with ancient aliens? You're gonna, I wanna, you're gonna I binge it after this conversation. No, I know. There's no way we may as well involve the Warhammer universe. I find that a more plausible explanation for what's happening than you know. I, I I'm gonna go with that explanation, but no, I uh, I'll, I'll um. If if we ever set up a um a cool place for us to do this podcast in the metaverse, 
we totally need to play clips of ancient aliens when we uh, there we go man. We'll, we'll, we'll get it going we'll get it going <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, with this book here, you know, virtual society, like we're, like we're talking about, um, you know, I, I think that, you, like I said, you've done a really great job of kind of defining these things and, and the idea of what a virtual society really is. And, you know, uh, th this is this is not a subject that, that that many people approach from the way you've approached it, right? Approaching it from, you know, a technical aspect, from an economical aspect, and not from a sci-fi aspect. This is not a sci-fi book, right? This is a book that is written from those angles. And uh, with your extensive experience, you know, and working across some of these different uh, disciplines here, and then also taking, you know, experiences from other people's books and, and, and from history as well, which I think uh, is really cool. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big, uh, you know, fan of history. So, you know, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, this book and the launch date and why everyone should be going out and grabbing it. Well, it's launching next week. And look, that's an amazing intro. So thank you so much for reading it. Thank you so much for doing it. And I should also say, I stole a lot of the ideas from many of my co-founders and partners at Improbable. I've credited a lot of them in the book. But, you know, this is the product of a lot of like beer-based conversations with yeah. amazing people throughout the industry who've kind of come to, together with it. But I, I guess what I'd say is, you know, there are two ways to understand a new phenomenon. You can read a bunch of books and articles that look at it like a trend, you know, like who's doing what, what comes next. Oh, it's the new internet, you know, looking for an analogy. And I think that tends to lead people down a path where they're they're not thinking about cars, they're thinking about faster horses, right? They're extrapolating right. out from their known experience. The only other approach, unless you can see the future, and unfortunately I can't, is you need to start from first principles. What, you know, instead of looking at, you know, cars or horses, what are the basic governing dynamics of how we build transport networks? You know, how do we price how people get around? What is the psychology around how people use these things? If you can get into those core dynamics, then you can start to develop genuinely original theories about how things will pan out. And so for me, like researching and writing the book was surprising. The conclusions that kind of came out of the book for me, assuming and hoping that they're, that they're you know, well validated by other, other readers and, 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 and better thinkers were really, really odd. One of them is that there'll probably be labor, actual work that is never automated and never can be automated. Not because we can't have um, human level AI, but because the actual value of the work in a metaverse comes from the people doing the work, being participants in the society that you're part of. Like it means something, think of it like handcrafted goods. So it's quite interesting when you start to unpack, you know, looking at the future and the past from this lens, you start to see that society has some really interesting challenges ahead of it. Another one that I found quite valuable is the need for fulfillment. You know, I, I used to think fulfillment was something you could get and it's nice to have. If people do not get fulfillment in their jobs and the opportunity for fulfillment in their own lives, they have terrible mental health outcomes. You know, I was, re I was researching and talking to certain scientists in this area. It's amazing how bad it is for you not to have fulfilling experiences. So then you start to wonder, well, society has to create more and more fulfilling experiences for more and more people in more and more countries. How do you do that efficiently? The metaverse starts becoming a necessity in enabling that type of value. Just a few ideas from the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like just unpacking all of that uh, is definitely something that, you know, you, you're doing just in the first couple of, you know, first couple of pages <laughs> of, of this book, which uh, like I said, I, I re really highly recommend people to go pick it up. I, I'm still working my way through it. So I'm excited to kind of read the rest of the journey that you have uh, written here. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to a point where we've been on here for a lot longer than we anticipated, but man, this is a really great conversation, Herman. I really appreciate you being on the channel and talking a little bit with me about the metaverse, about improbable, about gaming, about life. And, uh, I hope everyone uh, really enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And thank you again for being here. Oh, and, and please, if possible, do try to pull your audience on whose facial hair is superior. I, I personally think this, this look implies a greater ability to generate facial hair than, than yours does but you're, you know that's something you're we, gonna we can leave up <laughs> let's just pull him pull him pull him pull him i'll, I'll take you on that i'll come i'll come all back right. again if i lose all right all right that's it that's it I'm, I'm screenshotting this right now and we're gonna put it on twitter and we're gonna pull and then see what it does and see what we can do so so that that is that's happening right now let me let me make sure i get this uh let me get a good one all right like uh just uh all right smile ready oh that one wasn't good one more one more <laughs> there we go <laughs> all right screenshot of that saving that bad boy <laughs> there we go so, well, hey. really <laughs> <laughs> well once again herman thank you so much uh, for being here with us uh but i think that's all we have for today folks until next time stash that well, crypto friends
That was awesome. Thank you so much.